Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So interesting that the Holy Spirit would choose two different songs referring to the Creator as the I Am. The great I Am. That Sandy would use the same introduction to that song that I was led to use where Moses said, well, who should I tell them since you? Tell them I Am. Just tell them I am. Do you know the power of I and the never ending descriptor am? That's present, past, and future tense. As she said, another translation says, I will be all that I will be. I will be all that you will need me to be. I am. Is all you need to know is that I am. You guys are used to hearing. I, I have notes. I have a sermon. I, I, I have something prepared. I promise you. But I want you all to think about something. Because you may not have another day to think about this. See, that song says, there is no power in hell, and there is none that can stand in his presence. See, I read a story, and I want to say his first name is Leonard, but I don't know that for sure. That he woke up one morning, and he saw his own obituary. It was written out about the things that he had done. And this man, Leonard, and I, I want to say that it's Leonard Nobel. He's the creator of dynamite. He developed the chemical composition of dynamite. And in his obituary, it said that he was the father of destruction. As he read his own obituary, he was going to be remembered for creating the substance that would destroy things, that would tear things down, that would blow things up, that would kill things, that would flatten and level things, that would ruin things. And as he read his own obituary, he said, I don't want to be known for that. I don't want to be known for that. So he took all of the prophets, everything that he had made as a prophet, for this invention of dynamite everything that he had and he reinvested in and said I want people to put forth their efforts for good for the good of mankind for the things that will bring forth good and if you caught the last name Nobel the year of his death was the first year that that money got put to use that the Nobel Peace Prize started to be awarded to those that brought forth the most good in the earth why do I share any of that with you? What do you care about, Dynamite or this guy Leonard or Nobel Peace Prizes? Because odds are nobody in Canapolis is getting one this year. Just throwing that out there. But uh, what I want you to think about, what would your obituary say? If you woke up tomorrow, and I know none of us get the newspaper anymore, we get it all through social media and we get it online, but if you woke up tomorrow and you started reading Kevin Corll's obituary. Am I going to like what it says about what I did for my fellow man, for my church, for my family? What are you going to be known for? Are you going to be the father of destruction and death? Or are you going to be known for the good that you brought forth? See those songs, the I am. Tell them the I am sent you, Sandy. The I will be what I will be. I I'll take a little bit of liberty and say, I'm going to be what you need before you need it. 
See, wherever you are in your walk, I, I don't know where you're at. Some of you were praising the Lord. Some of you are having a struggle, a hard time being in the building today, being awake today, walking, walking one foot in front of the other. I don't know where you're at with your walk, but I'm here to tell you that the I am said, I got you today. I got something for you today that you didn't come here by mistake. You're here because I need you to be here, because I want you to be here, because I've called you to be here. Throughout this series, we've been talking about being people of purpose, of being created on purpose for a purpose. And in the second week, we talked about figuring out what our purpose was, and we gave you a, 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 a circle chart that you can start to narrow that thing down and pray about it and say, hey, what, what am I here for? Why am I created? Why did God create me? If, if those scriptures are true that he created me in my mother's womb and for great things and for purpose, why am I here? And in the third week, we talked about that we're all part of a body. You know, I really freaked you guys out yeah, last week when I talked about finding that foot in the woods. Just a foot laying there, not attached to anything, just decaying, rotting away, a foot in the woods. How out of place that would be. Because we're not supposed to be a foot or a hand or a body part that's not connected to the body. Not here to do the things that he's called us to do as part of the greater body. And we talked about all of the systems within our body of how God created us so that we could work independently because I'm here to tell you if I had to think about come on y'all gotta help me breathe out y'all gotta help me I can't think on two things at once now heartbeat beat 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 breathe in breathe out if I had to think about all those things I'd get nothing done but see God's put all of our systems to work together that those things would feed other things that if I didn't breathe in, the heart couldn't carry the oxygen to the rest of the parts of the body, that I couldn't stretch forth my hand, that I couldn't step forth my foot, that I couldn't do the things that he's called me to do. If all of these things, see that we went into Romans 8 and 28, that all things are called for those that are called according to his purpose. All things work together for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. Amen. Are you called according to his purpose? I mean, I've worn y'all out with being people of purpose, but are you called according to his purpose? The key scriptures for this are Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. How many know that God still gives away gifts every single day? He has given us grace. James, what is grace? Unmerited favor. That's all grace is. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. There's nothing we can do to get it. And then what did Paul continue to say? Not by work so that no one can boast. You can't brag about these things. You can't say, I did this. I can't save myself. See, I had a man that came and died on a tree that I was saved, that I was redeemed, that shed blood, that, that exchanged my sins for the life that he had in heaven. For we are God's handiwork. Yes. We're his masterpiece. Yes. We're his piece of art. The Greek word there is poema. We are his poem that he would speak that he would call us out. We are his hand. We are what he wants to put on display for the rest of the world to see as he uses us for the gifts that he has given us. The things, and see, I haven't even turned it on yet. You guys are in trouble. Might be in real trouble because it's still coming on. Last week, if you were here, if you watched online or you got a chance to go back and look at it, Starting a service was, was rocky, it was shaky. I was shaken. And I told you during service that the enemy himself walked in through our very front doors to interrupt, to distract, to disrupt what was going on in the house for what he had for you that day. And if y'all know me, I don't just let go of that. I, I struggle with it. I will do analysis until I am paralyzed. God, what were you trying to do? Why was that? Why did you allow that to happen? Why do those, why, why, why? I have to ask why. I have to get to a reason why. And see, 
I'm very fortunate this particular week that he shows at 534 Saturday morning while I'm asleep. Yes, God. <laughs> it's really comfortable here in my bed. We've got the heat set up just right, and I got the ceiling fan on, and the dogs aren't making noise, and what? What? Get up. Okay. Went in, Caleb, to the couch. That's our dining room table, if you don't know. We've moved into a house in the living room right now, so it's junk stack this high so we don't have a couch our couch is our dining room table so when Caleb comes over to sit with Caitlin we all sit around the dining room table and they're very uncomfortable old wooden chairs they're actually brother and sister Eastham's old wooden table they're very uncomfortable so we don't sit there long we find something to do but I'm sitting at the couch Saturday morning and by this time it's 5 36 I'm like yes God what would you have me do he said go to second Corinthians Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and just start reading. And as I continue to read, I get up to verse 10. For we must all. How many people are all? Are any of you in here not part of all? Just wanted to make sure that I understood the English language properly. That for we must all, we, all of us in this room, everybody listening online that ever watches this because it's going to be on the internet forever. Once it gets on the internet, you can't get it off. We must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. I've stood on this platform, I've stood at men's meetings, I have told you for years and years and years in Sunday school that we are all going to make it to heaven. Mike, you're going to make it. You got your card punched, you're going to make it to heaven. You can go home now. Just be sure you hear the next line before you get out the back door. Because you see, you're all going to make it to heaven, but it's up to you whether you get to stay. It's up to you what you get to hear from the maker that says, Welcome home, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. So we're all, we're all. She didn't move to scripture. What did you go forward for? Go back to 10. For we all must stand before Christ to be judged. In another place in the Bible it says, We will all bow before him, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Christ the Lord. So you see, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong in my theology about what I teach, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that He is the Son of the living God, and that God has sent the Holy Spirit to be here with us and within us, to guide us and to help us through this. If I'm wrong about that, no foul to you. You're still okay. But if you happen to have the theology of, that preacher's crazy. Okay, I'll give you that. But he's crazy and I don't believe him. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to live like there is no Jesus, like Jesus didn't come to this earth, like there is no God, like there is no. I'm going to live the way that I want to live and I'm going to let it get sorted out. What is it? Kill them all and let God sort it out? Well, he's going to. For we all must stand before Christ to be judged. And as the brother Paul continued to write, and we're all going to acknowledge that he is Jesus. We're all going to bow before him. We're all going to say with our mouth that he is Lord. So I want you to write down on, you know, if it's on your hand, if it's in your little notepad, if you take your notes, if it's on the back of your bulletin that you save, if it's on the back of this little note card that you're not going to bring back, somewhere I want you to write today's date down and go, that crazy preacher told me so that when you get before him, if you chose to live the way that you wanted to live, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You get to see all the splendor of heaven, but you don't get to go in. I want you to remember 
that day in February to that crazy used car salesman jacket wearing preacher. Can I put you in a used car today? What will it take to get you to sign today? That's what I think of every time I take this jacket out of the closet. But that day in February, I gave you the truth. I told you you're going to stand before me. I told you you're going to answer for the good or the evil. Now remember Ephesians 2, 8, it says that it's not by works that no man could boast. We can't earn our way into heaven. This is a free gift. It's of grace. It's given to you freely that you need to do it. But then James, anybody read James lately? Mm -hmm. Only a few people get that joke. In the book of James, he says that faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. But see, if you look in Ephesians, you go back to the beginning of that chapter 2. In Ephesians, it talks about that we were all once dead in our sins, in iniquity. That he, what, brought life back. But God, I think it says in verse 4, but God brought life back to us. You guys are in deep, deep trouble because this thing is dead. That means it's, I get to do whatever I It came on. You've been saved by grace. Unmerited favor once again has come your way. See, picking up in verse 11 in 2 Corinthians. Because we understand our fearful responsibility. Are you afraid of the Lord? You know, some people today, in today's society, they don't have a respectful fear for the Lord. You, know, you want to shake your fists at him and tell him, but God, I want to do I, I, Careful. Careful. He's still God. No matter what you think or what you say or what generation you're from, he is still the creator of the universe and the one that can cause you to fall. How's it go, Jonathan? Because we understand the fearful responsibility of the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. Do you? I've spent the last hour and eight minutes trying to persuade you already. And all you're thinking about is it's lunchtime. I'm on the first page of 16 pages of notes. And she brought crackers that can share. We will bless those. Like your little chicken nugget meal, and we will, the the loaves and fishes will be multiplied. We will be fine today. God knows we are sincere. God knows we are sincere, and hope you know this too. We are commending ourselves to you again. Know we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. Wow. Did you hear what that said? That you can honor those that say they have a spectacular ministry rather than a sincere heart. Which would you rather have? Sincerity or a rock star? Smoke and lights and mirrors or Jesus who died for you? You want to have a a, a spectacular ministry before you or somebody that says, this is what the truth says, the word of God says this. But if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. So I will put on a used car salesman jacket every day of the week. If it makes you pay attention and stay awake to hear the scriptures, that you too could be convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins to redeem you, and that God is going to send him again to call us home, and he's given us a Holy Spirit along the way that's going to help us. See, I've told you guys over and over again, I'm not going to argue with you things that don't affect your salvation. If you want to argue about the Holy Spirit, hey, we're cool. If y'all want to fight this thing out without him, you can make it. It's going to be tough, but you can make it. Not without Jesus and God, but you can make it without the Holy Spirit. It's going to be tough. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God, and if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. 
He died for everyone so that those who will receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Caitlin, they're not listening to me anyway, so I'll just pray. Father, we come before you to lift up your holy name, to worship you and to give you glory and honor and praise this morning, that your scriptures would not be returned void, that they would pierce the hearts of those that are in this room that are online listening to me this morning, Father God, because they are listening to the words that are coming directly out of heaven. For these are things that you have sent for the people to hear. So Father, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, that we may receive from heaven what it is that you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. So when we are in Christ through faith, which we're going to demonstrate in baptism here in a few weeks, we're a new creation. We're showing the world that we're a new creation, but how do we become a new creation? Romans 6 and 4 clearly tells us, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the power of the Father, now we also have new lives. We become a new creation. But why does he make us a new creation? What's wrong with the old creation? That was magical. <laughs> Why does he make us a new creation? So we can live a new life. He created us new so that we would step out into what he has already created for us to accomplish. So we've been talking about this for weeks. He created us for a purpose, to, to do the works that he created for us before we were born. Before we were, he had something for us to do. I don't know that that has sunk into your heads yet, that as people of purpose, before we even came into existence, he already knew what he had for us to do. We just got to step into it. We got to say, yes, Lord, I'm gifted in that. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll accept that call, that responsibility, that new life, and I'll be a new creation in you so that I can go and answer those things. Because Romans 6, 5 through 11 continues with, since we have been united with him in this death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Some of you know some of this, but I'll share it all. So that everybody's on the same page. I was born in Southern California. Do not hold that against me. We didn't stay. See, I was born of two young adults in the 70s, 60s, 70s, raised Catholic, but had no idea what they wanted to do in life. They just went through Catholic school and they knew what the Catholic Church taught them. But see, as those young adults not knowing what they wanted to do with life and they hatched this, this thing, whatever you call me, there in Southern California, they got a divorce. Tanya, I saw a billboard sign going to prayer conference last week that says, life is short, get a divorce. That's the world we live in now. Life is short, just get a divorce. Don't worry about seeing things through or working things out or making it be don't worry about standing on the word of god and living for one another don't worry about it life is short just go do what you want to do get a divorce so these two catholic people got this divorce and my mother met this guy this long-haired yeah somebody asked me when i'm gonna get my hair cut i'm not met this long-haired guy that had just gotten out of the military that she fell in love with and she's still 18 19 herself and they moved across the country in a Volkswagen, nothing wrong with Volkswagens, and a U-Haul, nothing wrong with U-Haul, but we moved into a 48-foot single-wide trailer, and there's nothing wrong with manufactured homes, but I'm here to tell you my story, okay? We moved to Statesville, North Carolina, and we moved into a very short, single-wide home in a low-income place. Why am 
not telling you any of this. Why not tell you the things I've told you for the last several weeks? Because I'm here to tell you is that until you discover that God had a purpose for you, I was born on the other side of the country to people that believed a lie. They were Catholic. They prayed to Mother Mary. Okay? I, I mean, not Jesus, not Jehovah God. They, they were believing a lie. And they were working for the church. And then they decided they were going to get divorced. And then they moved to Statesville, North Carolina and got this little bitty thing. My dad's a truck driver. Nothing wrong with being a truck driver. My mom's a, an operator. Wore one of those headsets that worked for Southern Bell. Plugging in the switchboard. None of you young kids have a clue what I'm talking about. She would literally, whenever you would call in, she would take that, your cord and plug it in over here so that your call could be completed. That's how my parents started in North Carolina. And why do I share that kind of a humble beginning to let you know Ed, I didn't know 12 years ago when I'm picking up five rocks on Camp Little Light that I'm going to be standing up here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I certainly didn't know 50 or something years ago that when I was coming from California in a Volkswagen with a U-Haul. And my parents didn't know. Because see, those parents got divorced again and they both got remarried again. So I had to make a decision in my life that, you know what? Y'all saw that, that proclamation, that declaration that we say? There is no curse on my life. I had to make a decision as a young man that I, I'm not going to go down this cursed life. I'm not, I mean, if you've been divorced, there's nothing wrong. Please, please don't. I am not here to crucify or throw stones. I'm empty-handed, okay? I'm here to tell you that I had to make a decision. I had to for me. That I'm not going to continue to bring up my kids that it's okay, life is short, get a divorce that, that that's the kind of lifestyle that I wanted them to be brought up in I wanted to say you know what life is hard and I'm going to work it out life is tough but I'm going to go to the father life, life, life gets, gets, gets rough but I'm going to go to the scriptures and I'm going to go seek wise counsel and I'm going to work it out with my spouse my helpmate that God brought into my life that I could continue to make it through that's what I had to make a decision at a young age that I wasn't going to have that attitude of life is short just get a divorce and you can apply that to so many things. It's not just divorce. So please, I am not here condemning anyone in any way, shape, or form. Please do not hear that out of my, what I'm saying to you this morning. What I'm trying to say to you is that God has called you for a purpose. He has put you into motion to do something for his kingdom that is bigger than you. It is bigger than your parents. It is bigger than your children. It is bigger than anything you could possibly think up. Because again, I, I asked you, we started off the service. How did you get here? How did you get here today? And I'm not talking about you got in the Denali and drove here. What decision did your grandparents, your parents, you, your children, if you have them, your grandchildren, what decisions have been made that but when you put them all together, make up your life? See, when you think of it that way, those two kids getting engaged last night, that, that wasn't happenstance. That's a series of events that God saw before the beginning of time. That he said, if you'll answer the call here, and you'll answer the call here, and you'll say yes here. And he has directed all those things to work together to say, I'm going to ordain something that's going to be greater than they could ever possibly imagine. And I don't know that they put their head around it yet. Because y'all have heard my story with Tanya. When I walked into that church 36 years ago, she poked her girlfriend. I'm going out with that boy. I didn't meet her for six more weeks, folks. Y'all don't understand. She said it before I ever met her. I'm going out with that boy. That's God's providence. That's God being I am. That's God being I will be who I will be. That's God saying, you know what? That girl answering the call that night when he came to listen to gospel music because he answered the call to come listen to the gospel music, that set things in motion. That I had the ability to make the decision that I'm not going to walk in this cursed life with a curse. I'm going to follow after Christ. It ain't been perfect. I got some bruises. I cut a tree a few years ago. My wife and my kids still make fun of me. I have a scar across my thigh because when I cut that tree down, you know, I know how to do it, Ed. Father said, no, you don't. I cut through those jeans and that thigh muscle on the top of that and I realized real quick like I didn't know what I was doing. 
But see, a paper towel and, and electrical tape will fix anything, right? Because that's what she came home to. I had a paper towel wrapped around the outside of my jeans and electrical tape around the outside of my jeans. I said, will you help me clean this out? She said, I ain't getting nowhere near that. We're going to the hospital. That's the way we think we can go at life. We think we can say, oh, it's just a little tree. I've got a chainsaw. I know how to start it. I know how to do it. I know how to do it. See, you about cut your leg off. The Lord will teach us valuable lessons through our stupidity or through our obedience. So what do we do with the incredible knowledge about being a people of purpose? What do we do with the understanding that we are created on purpose, for a purpose? I gave you action cards last week. I gave you a card that says, what do you want to do? What do you want to serve? How do you want to serve? And if you've been, been getting phone calls all week long and said, oh, you, you want to serve in worship? And you're going, yeah, I want to worship in church. No, we want you to serve in worship departments. Not just show up and sit out there in a pew and go, oh, I'm worshiping. See, most of the people that check those things off were already doing things. Though Sister Dolores is going, that's what I want. I want to just be in worship. But see, Sister Dolores already does our communion. That is part of worship. Brother Jimmy said, oh, I want to be part of worship. Well, you're blowing the shofar. You're already in worship. See, the people that filled them out, they already knew where their calling was, and they, they signed up to serve in the places that they're called to serve in. But see, the thing that was really cool that happened this week, I asked 104 people in here last week, what do you want to do to serve this church and this community and the kingdom? But on Thursday, I had a gentleman show up here that doesn't go to this church that I've never met before in my life that talked to Sister Darlene back there in the clothes closet saying, I need to talk to the pastor. He called me back there and I said, what can I help you with? He's like, I'm retiring in a couple of weeks and my church don't have any of these things. Can I come over here and serve? I want that to resonate with you, that people that go to another church down the street said, I'm retiring and I got a couple days a week on my hands, that I just want to come serve the kingdom. I just want to come serve the community. I just want to come serve other people of like mind. I, he didn't ask to join the church. He didn't ask to pay any tithes. He didn't ask to bring any offering in. He didn't ask to be baptized. He just said, I just want to come serve. So you want to tell me that we're not in the right season, that God is calling us with people of purpose that we need to serve? He's sending people that we don't know to come here and serve. He's going to be here the first Thursday in March. So pack up boxes of food and give them away. He's not coming to church here. I'm not asking him. I'm not proselyting. I'm not trying to tell him that you need to come to church here in order to serve. See, we're a light on the hill. We are the place up here that we can shine to the community. I've shared with some of you, you know, that, that cell tower in the back right there, that's not a mistake either. They did research. Engineers researched the topography of all of Kannapolis and said, they're one of the highest points in Kannapolis. We need to put our cell tower in their backyard. Well, that was just a coincidence, preacher. It's a coincidence that we're the highest point in Kannapolis and the Bible says that we are to be a light on the hill. That's a coincidence, huh? It's a coincidence that this used to be a watermelon farm that people would cut through to go fishing, but now we're able to here to give out the fruit of God and the fruit of the Spirit. That's a coincidence, right? All of these God things that we can add together, the numbers that only God can add up, those are all coincidences. They're just happenstance. I don't believe so. So see, we don't want to teach information, but we want to teach transformation. We don't want you to just know that you're created on purpose for a purpose. We want you to live your purpose. So today I want to challenge you. There's two groups of people, and those two groups need to make two different commitments. See, group one are the not yet Christians. You've been learning about how God has handcrafted you. You've been learning that you are the poem of God, that you are his handiwork, that you are his masterpiece, that you are his, his, his created art. You've been discovering that the purpose of your life might be. You've been learning how God has designed you to live out that purpose in community with others and in the family of God. However, today God is calling you to take a step of faith in order to make that purpose a reality. And that step of faith is to place your faith in Christ. To surrender your life to the ways of God and demonstrate your faith through baptism in two weeks. So you remember I told you that you got, a, you got that, that insert in your bulletin. 
you'd like to be baptized, if you'd like to give your life to Christ, we're going to do that on the third. If you can't do it on the third, we'll do it another day. If you want to do it in a river, I told you, I've got MIPs. We'll put them in the river. I'll stand on the shores. I will egg them on. Sandy's dying to get in the river in March. I know she is. Jeff's hiding back there behind the computer screen, but I know he wants to get in the icy, icy cold waters of the North Carolina mountains and do some baptism. I know he is. I can see it all over his face, and Jess is going, yes, please, do that. See, today is calling you to take that step of faith in order to make your purpose a reality, and that step is to place your faith in Christ, to surrender your life to the ways of God and demonstrate your faith through baptism. Listen to that call. See, Acts 2, 38-40, Peter said this, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. All who have been called of the Lord are God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all the listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Did I tell you that I saw a billboard that said life is short? Do whatever you want. Life is short, get a divorce. Life is short, just throw it all away. It doesn't matter what you do because we're living in a crooked generation. They're putting it on billboards on the roadside that says you can do whatever you want. See, there's a second group that are the Christians. We have placed our faith in Christ. We have surrendered to live in his ways. We have demonstrated our faith through baptism. We have been given the spirit of God to walk with us, guide us, and empower us in living out our God-given purpose. However, are you taking action on your God-given purpose? Are you truly doing what you're called to do, what you've discovered that your purpose is? See, an axe that never chops wood still has a purpose. It just isn't fulfilling it. A car that never leaves the driveway has incredible potential, but the potential's being wasted. A plane that never flies is a great sadness because it was created to soar through the skies. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, and it breaks my heart to see so many Christians living in the hangar when you were created like by Christ to soar through the skies. You were designed by God to do a unique and extraordinary good work for His glory and for the good of others. Remember we talked about Nobel. What's your obituary going to say? Are you going to be known as the father of destruction? Are you going to be known about what you've done for the good of the kingdom? See, your obituary's not been printed yet. You're still figuring that out. So it's just like that scripture we read in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. You're going to stand before him. What you hear you get to have a part in. Whether you hear, welcome home, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you, that's up to you. You know, I love the people that want to argue with me that says, why would a loving God send anybody to hell? He won't. That's your choice. Free will. You choose. Your decision. Same thing with the obituary. You choose. Your decision. What do you want to be known for? What do you want people to read about you after you're gone? Do you want to be known as somebody that served for the greater good of the kingdom? See, we must take action to live out our unique purpose, but we must commit to step out on that faith that saved us and began doing good works when we were, when we were created in Christ to do. King Jesus is looking for faith in action. See, will you surrender to God's purpose for your life this morning if you'll remember the very first week we started this series john 17 1 through 4 jesus this is jesus this is christ these are red letters if you subscribe to that after saying these things jesus looked up in heaven and said see it's in quotes this is jesus talking so if you're a christian if you're a believer of christ this is the son of god saying these words out loud out of his mouth so that john could write them down for us to read i want you to understand that the importance of that. Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this way to have, this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, the I am, the I will be what I will be. That I'm going to be what you need me to be. 
the great I am, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. How do you bring glory to God? Do the work. Do the work. Do what work, preacher? What you're called to do. Before you were created, he created a work for you to do that only you can do. Remember last week we talked about he doesn't need you. He wants you. Huge, huge difference. God doesn't need me. He wants me. God doesn't need you. But he wants you. He wants you to step into your gift and step into your calling and step into your purpose and bring glory to him by completing the work that he's given you to do. That's all he wants you to do. See, before we ever started the series, you guys knew what it was, right? WGSP. Worship God, serve people. That's the simplified version. It's what we're here for. That's our purpose. Worship God and serve people. That's what every one of us are created to do is to worship him and to serve other people. But see, we want to get behind that t-shirt. Yeah, I printed the t-shirt so you can buy one. WGSP. I'm doing it, preacher. I'm doing it. And wearing the t-shirt ain't doing it. You got to figure out what your calling is, what your purpose is, what your gifting is, and you got to step into that. I don't care if you wear a t-shirt or not, but step into it and walk it out like they said in the video. You got to walk it out every single day. Because as long as I have breath, I have something else I need to do this day. He's giving me breath for a reason. He's given me this purpose so that I can continue to step out and do the things that he's called me to do. Remember the two greatest moments in a man's life? The day he was born. It was a pretty good day for me. I don't know about y'all. What was the second greatest moment? The day he finds out why. Why was I born? Why am I here? Am I making a difference? Can people count on me? Am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I bringing God glory by completing the purpose? See, Jesus is that ultimate example. Jesus had a purpose, and it's no different for each of us. We can bring glory to God with our lives when we complete the work he has for us to do. See, Jesus received his purpose. Jesus submitted to his purpose. Jesus lived for his purpose, and Jesus completed his purpose. And you say, well, what was the work that Jesus finished? I'm glad you asked. The scriptures answer it. Luke 22, 39 through 42. Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed. Again, this is quotes, red letters. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. But I want your will to be done, not mine. And you guys know I pray, I preached that. that. That was in the garden, the garden of pressure. We, we talked about that, that he went through with that cup that God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. The separation of him from the Father, that he took the sins of the world upon his shoulders, that we could be redeemed. He says, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. It should be the life goal of every person that at the end of your life you can say, I brought glory to God on earth by finishing the work he gave me to do. See, I know without a doubt that God has a purpose for my life. I can tell you that in this season, it is to serve from behind this desk. It is to call people out there, out there on the internet, to come and serve behind the desk that he's called them behind. To serve God, to worship God, to serve other people, to understand your calling, to do the things that he's seen. I was asked last week to go visit a woman I've never met. She's a neighbor of a couple that comes to this church, and she's on hospice. She wants to talk to a man of God. I said, well, that ain't me. Yeah, it is. She wants to talk to you. Okay. So Friday morning, I drove over there. And I listened to what she had to say, and I'm not going to give away everything that she had to say, but she wanted to know that she knew. She'd served God her whole life, and she's now in hospice. The doctors and the nurses have told her, you're going to die. 
you're probably going to die here in this home, in this hospital bed, with your neighbors coming over here fixing you eggs in the morning. And she said, you know, I know Jesus. I know the scriptures. I know God. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you don't know what that is, we can talk about that later. That's not what we're here to talk about this morning. But she wanted to have her faith renewed that Jesus was still in her and with her. And we went through a few scriptures and a few stories and a few things and we got up and we prayed. And the Spirit fell in that room on every person in that room. We picked her up out of the floor and put her back into her rocker because she had to stand up. She wanted to stand up. We anointed everybody with oil just like the book of James says. I explained to her the same thing I explained to y'all. You know, you can come forth. We can anoint with oil. We can call forth the elders. We can pray the prayer of faith. But without you believing, if you don't believe, she said, oh, no, I believe, preacher. I believe. The Spirit fell in that room. And Amy, I thought of your mom. She started laughing in the Holy Ghost. That undeniable, yes. infectious laughter that filled that entire neighborhood. And it was a great day. And I told Tanya, I said, if I can go see people that can't help the church and can't help me, every hour of every day of my life for the rest of my life that's what I'm called to do it doesn't matter what I do here what I do here and what I do with this used car salesman jacket on what matters is, is that I go where God has called me to go and that I pray what he's called me to pray and that people get to get their faith renewed that they get to say you know what Jesus is still with me the Holy Ghost is still with me and I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it to heaven preacher there ain't nothing she can do to help me other than I had a time in the Lord in that hour and a half that I can't explain I can't explain it to anybody in this room that that was if I could do that every hour of every day my purpose would be fulfilled because that's what we're called to do it doesn't matter that you can help this church or that you can help me or you can help my family or you can help this community what matters is, is that God and you get together again before it's too late that's all that matters that's what all of our purpose is is for you to understand that God loves you and God doesn't need you, but He wants you. I haven't been in these notes for a while, folks. I told you at the beginning of service, you had another card there. But you got two choices. It doesn't say no on the back. And my question to you is, will you answer God's call? That's between you and him to figure out. If you need to come to know him as your personal savior today, I've got anointing oil. I've got people here of faith that will pray with you. We will pray that prayer of faith. We will pray the prayer of salvation. We can get you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you can leave out of here different than the way you walked in if that's what you're looking for. But that's not the call that I'm asking you for right now. I'm asking you, do you want to do what God has called you to do? Do you want to be the man that shows up at a church that you don't attend that says, I just want to serve? I got some time on my hands and I just want to serve. Do you want to be a lady that's sitting in a room that you can't help this preacher, you can't help this church? But that you need to come back to knowing what God's got for you. Amen. So you need your faith renewed today. You need to be able to say yes. I thought it very interesting that today is the day that you guys are coming in and that this series was delayed by three weeks in the middle. Y'all didn't know that. Y'all had no idea I'm handing out yes cards and you didn't know you had a video that said you got to say yes. And what y'all don't know is that when you go on that mountain, there's a time for you to say yes to what Jesus has got for you. See, I truly believe that that is what God is looking for all of us to do is to say, and you're gonna, take the card with you. If you don't want to step up here, I'm not going to put something on you that you don't want on you. If you don't want prayer, I'm not going to touch it. But I am going to ask you that if you'll answer yes to God, if you'll bring them up here to this altar and you bring these cards, because this is something that's between you and God. This is not between you and me. It's not between anybody in this building. You know what God has called you to do. 
I have told you for weeks now, and if this is your first week and you're going, oh, no, I'm off the hook. He ain't told me. You know what God's called you to do. You know if you're right with God. You know in your knower. We've all got a knower. Deep inside. You know that you know that you know. That Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Because see, everybody wants a Savior. Nobody wants a Lord. Save me, Lord. Okay, follow me. Nah, I'm good with that. Serve me. No, 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 I'm good with that. We all want a Savior. But do you want a Lord? Caitlin, will you play that first song? Would you stand with me this morning? As this ensemble sings this song, I want you to search your heart. I want the Holy Spirit to search your innermost being. And I want Him to ask you, will you say yes this morning? Will you come to what I've called you to? Will you step up? Be the man or woman of God I've called you to be. You know what, if you've Falling away from him, like I said, there's people even you just got to come up here and say, hey, I want to have the prayer of salvation. I want to renew my faith. I want to find the Holy Ghost. Whatever it is that you need, you come up here and you tell me, and we will find the people. We've got oil. We'll read you up, or we will leave you alone. You can leave this car to the altar. But that is my question for you this morning. Will you answer the call that God has in your life? And if you will, my ask of you is to just bring it up here and lay it on this altar, anywhere on this altar. Don't have your name on it. I'm not going to collect it. I'm not going to call you. I don't have your number. Some of these people in here, I don't even know who you are. This is a commitment that you are making to the Father. That you trust in Him. And that you've heard what He's asked you. And that you're going to give Him a yes. Publicly. A yes. And again, I don't know what the question is. So I can't follow up on this. It's totally between you and God. Would you do that? Perfect submission And all is at rest I know the offer of tomorrow Has ordered my steps So this is my story And this is my song My song I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. Oh, you sing with I you? trust in God. yes to him today he is not capable of failing you we can fail him but he is not capable of failing us hallelujah
promise. He never promised us happiness, but he promised us joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So stand in the strength of the Lord because you know what? We cry from midnight hour. But the scriptures tell me, the scriptures tell me that in the morning, joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah.